Uh, welcome to virtual GED class. We are talking about solving for missing dimensions algebraically. Basically, when I say algebraically, I mean using the GED formula sheet. We've seen the GED formula sheet a lot in the last few weeks. We've looked at it and we've used it to solve for perimeter. Uh, we've used it to solve for area, for surface area, and for volume. And we've even seen a couple pretty simple problems about solving for missing dimensions. Okay, and what does it mean to solve for a missing dimension? It means instead of them asking you to find perimeter or area or surface area or volume, they'll give you those things and they'll ask you to find instead a missing dimension. Okay, so what am I talking about when I say dimension? It's all those different things that we use when we find the perimeter area, surface area, volume. Okay, those are the lines that we use basically to measure shape. So for example, a rectangle has two dimensions. We generally refer to those as the length and the width of a rectangle. So of course, we've seen problems already where we could solve for length or solve for perimeter or area when giving, given length or width. But we know that we have this whole GED formula sheet, and as it turns out, and this is the important thing to today, uh, you can use a formula as long as you combine it with your algebra skills to solve for any missing dimension. But you can use a formula to solve for any missing dimension. That means if I bust out a formula uh, like the, for example, volume of a sphere formula, uh, I remember that one because Zereni, Zerenity and I just got to look at it earlier. I think it was volume equals four thirds times pi r cubed. So currently this formula has two variables in it, two variables. Those variables are in relation to each other in this formula, but I can use this formula to solve for either one of these variables, the V, which as we know stands for volume, which is how we did it in the last class, but we could also use it to solve for the other variable. So be very careful. Pi is not a variable. I know it looks like a variable to us, but pi is a known number. It doesn't vary. It's constant. Pi is always pi. It's always that number 3.14159, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but r is a variable. In this case, r is the radius. So I could use this particular formula to solve for V like we've been doing volume, or I can use it to solve for a missing R. Okay, so we are just basically going to do a ton of example problems today uh, because I don't need to talk a lot. I, I think I need to demo this. So just to let you ladies know, the GED maybe two, three years ago sent all of us adult education programs a list of problems. They called these problems the commonly missed GED problems, the ones that just about every student is missing. And these kinds of problems were on there. What does that mean to us? It means that these are some of the more challenging problems that you're going to see on the GED. So if you feel like you're in deep water, you are. However, we're going to break it down. It won't be too hard. Some of them are easier than others. And you'll probably get a couple like this on your GED. And if you can answer one or two of them correctly, you already have a serious score boost because you're better than most people. Most people get these problems wrong. I don't want you to worry about, do I understand everything, but just, did I get better than I was before? Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So here we go. So number one says a rectangle has an area of 42 square inches. If the width of the rectangle is eight inches, what is the length? So notice, unlike some of the other problems we've done in this unit, we're not finding area. This time we've been given area. We know it, it's known, okay? We do know one of the dimensions, we know the width. But notice my mystery. My mystery is still a dimension. They're asking what is the length I have a missing dimension. Now the first step is gonna be just like our first step always is when we're looking at these geometry problems that we're able to use the formula sheet with. Our first step is just gonna to be to write down the appropriate formula. So um, I do have a formula that relates the area of a rectangle to its width and length. But what 
uh, we would generally do here is we would take a look at the formula sheet. So I'm just Googling in my, I'm in Chrome, so my address bar will look like, work like a search bar. And you see it's the very first thing that comes up when you Google GED formula sheet, and this yeah. is it. This is the official GED formula sheet. You will be getting this when you go to take your test. This is a drop-down option on the computer, uh, but it only works if you know how to use it. <laughs> so we've been spending a lot of time practicing using this. Uh, but one of the things you can notice is that the very first section is area formulas. So what the very first thing we'll do is we'll just copy this formula right from the formula sheet, the area of a rectangle formula. So we said that our area of a rectangle formula was A equals LW, or area equals length times width. And as always, we just write our formula just the way it appears the first time we write it. But our second step, as usual, will be our substitution step. And this is where I want you to be really careful because students do something foolish. What they usually do here is they go, oh, A equals 42 times eight. And this makes me scream. We don't just automatically plug in, don't write that down. That last line is bunk. We don't just automatically plug in numbers just because we like the right-hand side of the equation. You really can only substitute in a number for the value uh, that it belongs to. Let me show you what I mean here. So let's erase this nonsense. I am gonna pull up a different color for my substitution so you can see it. But they told me that my area was 42. And so it's super important when I write 42, I write it under the A. And that's equal to, now length is the thing I'm looking for. I don't know my L, so L will remain a mystery. But I do know my W. My W, my width, eight. according to this problem, is eight. And so I'll substitute in an eight for my W. Now these two things are shoved together, so what are they doing? When two, a let, when two letters are shoved together in math class, they are? Multiplying. Multiplying. So I'm gonna use parentheses here to say multiplying. Now I have to tell you that looks really funny to me. To say 42 is equal to L times eight looks funny to me because I'm a mathematician. And mathematicians, when we talk about numbers and letters multiplying, usually write it the other way. We usually write the number first, like eight would come first, and the letter second. So 42 is equal to eight L is another way to write this problem. And honestly, myself and most of your math teachers will probably go straight from here to there. So don't freak out if they suddenly flip the order of multiplication so that the number can come first, okay? It's because mathematicians, that's our normal way of writing. So now, notice that my letter is not alone. This equation, uh, this formula relates area to length to width, but it's not necessarily solved for the thing that you want. The original formula has A alone, so the original formula is solved for A. I need to do the work, the algebraic work right now to get L alone. I need to solve for L. When we wanna solve, when we wanna move numbers away, we always do the opposite of what's happening. We undo things using the opposite. So right now this eight and this L are shoved together so I know they're multiplying, so I'm gonna do the opposite of multiplying. I'm going to divide by the number eight. Now that's just straight up me being disobedient, me making a change because I feel like it. Then that is only legal if I do it to both sides of the equation. So I'm gonna jump my equal sign and I'm gonna divide by eight over there as well. Eight multiplying and eight dividing are opposites, so they will cancel. So on my right hand, I'll see L alone like I wanted. And I would go right underneath, but I ran out of space. And on the left-hand side, 42 divided by 8, I see this, that's the math to do. So you can plug that into your calculator. If you did this on G, the GED, you would have a calculator. 42 divided by 8 gives me 5.25. So what is the length here? The length here, length here is 5.25 inches. And that would be my final answer. The length is 5.25 inches. Now I have to tell you the truth, ladies, honestly. Algebra is not necessarily the easy way, easiest way to solve this problem. Some students use arithmetic to do it, and there's nothing wrong with that. I don't care which way you do it. But because today we're practicing this skill of doing it with formulas, I'm going to continuously practice the algebraic method uh, because there are harder problems than this where you would be 
in a lot of trouble if you tried to use arithmetic and didn't understand the rules of algebra, the ability to move backwards. So number two, it says a triangle has an area of 14 square centimeters. If the base of the triangle is seven, what is the height? So once again, I see the word area in here. So once again, I'm gonna to head to my area section of my GED formula sheet. But this time my shape is a what? Triangle. A triangle. And so this time I'm gonna pick up the area of a triangle formula. And that will be my first step. So what is the area of a triangle formula? One over two BH. Yeah, so one A equals one over two or one half BH. So that's our first step to write out our formula. Our second step when we do things algebraically with our formulas is to do substitution. We'll trade out any number, any letters for known values. Any letters for known values. So what do we know in this problem? We know that the area, well the triangle has the area of 14 square centimeters. Exactly. So I'll substitute out the A for a 14 and do a swap, and I, but I won't change equal signs and I won't change numbers. I just taught this skill to a class today and half the class was dropping the half. Okay, so if you see a number in the formula, you need to still have a number in your formula. Okay, what else do I know? That the base is seven centimeters. The base is seven centimeters. So where I once saw a seven, I'm going to, or where I once saw a B, I'm going to plug in a seven. Notice I do that in parentheses. The half and the B are shoved together, so I know they're multiplying. And then H. We don't know H. That's what we're looking for. What is the height? So in algebra, when we have a mystery, we use a letter for a mystery. And so I will keep that H around. It's the mysterious thing I'm trying to solve for. Okay, now I have some wisdom, ladies, and this is the first time we've seen something like this. My wisdom is that you should simplify and we've talked about simplifying before. That's the forwards math that we do. That's obeying the symbols, symbols before you solve. Simplify before you solve. So do any forwards math that we know how to do before we start moving things around the equal sign. So I see some math that I can do. And maybe you say, Kate, I can't do that. I can't do fractions. Uh, but your TI sure can take a half of seven. Okay. Um, and so I'm going to be really lazy. I know a half is the same as 0.5, and I'm going to do 0.5 times 7. And I got, when I typed in 0.5 times 7, I got 3.5. And I've just replaced this part of my formula with a simpler number. I've simplified. Does that make sense? But mm -hmm. I haven't touched my H, I haven't touched my equal, and I haven't touched my 14. Is anybody mad at me? No. No. Okay, so very good principle. Clean up any, put together any numbers you know how. Do simplifying. Now, now there's no more work on the left or the right that I can do. Now's the time to start solving. I want that letter to be alone. So I have got to get rid of 3.5. Right now, 3.5 is all shoved up against that H. He's multiplying. So I'll do the opposite. I will divide. Now, the rule about of solving is I can do whatever I want as long as I do it to both sides. So I'm going to jump my equal sign and divide by 3.5 over there, too. Now let's see what happens. On this left-hand side, that's the work to do. So you may do it in your calculator for me. 14 divided by 3.5 is 4. Mm -hmm. And that's equal. And on this side, multiplying by 3.5 and dividing by 3.5 cancels. So all I have left is an H. So I just found out that my height is equal to 4. For what? Well, I was working with square centimeters. I was, but careful. And I should have mentioned this in the last problem, but I overlooked it. Notice that the height is not square centimeters. The height is just regular centimeters. Why? Because if you talk about a triangle, its base is just a line and its height is just a line. So make a note to yourself because all dimensions will be linear. I don't care if they came out of an area problem, a volume problem, a perimeter problem. The individual dimensions will all be linear, plain old linear units like inches, feet, meters, or yards. They won't be square. They won't be cubed. The dimensions themselves are just lines. Let's look at the next one. 
I really like the next one because students screw up the algebra by accident. So let's take a look at number three. It says a square has an area of 42 square inches. What is the side length of the square to the nearest tenth? Okay, so I notice that area got mentioned here, so I'll be in my area portion of my formula sheet. And I see the shape name. This is a square. Square. What formula shall I use? Area of a square. Yep, area of a square formula says what? Wouldn't it be A equals 42? Um, I'm going to get there, but I don't do any substitutions yet. The first thing I do is write down the formula exactly the way it appears on the formula sheet. Then I'll substitute in the known values. So A equals S squared. Exactly. Okay. So A equals S squared. Now this is the part that students who haven't done algebra before aren't used to, Saleya. When I go to plug in my 42, I don't go across the equal sign, I go underneath the A, and the A is now gone. I replaced the A with a 42 because it's not a mystery, I know what it is. And that's equal to, I can't plug in for side length because side length is this thing I'm solving for, it's the mystery. So the mystery stays a letter, and I don't change operations. And so I get this statement. Yes, the area is 42, and so now I know that the 42 must be equal to side squared. So now, there is no work to do on the left, there is no work to do on the right, all I need to do is get the letter alone, I need to solve for S. We always do that by doing the opposites, but the problem is people forget what the opposite of square is. So I'll just remind you, the opposite of add subtract. is subtract, the opposite of multiply, it's like I want you to remember this, I do this so often, huh? Serenity. Yes. The opposite or inverse of multiply is divide, and the opposite of inverse of square is what? <laughs> um, trying to think of it. Yeah, this is why I do this so stinking much, because it just falls out of students' brains. So the opposite or inverse of squaring is square root. Square yeah. root. Looks like a little check mark house. Have you ever seen that symbol before, Salea? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So what that is is the opposite or inverse of square. So if I wanted to get rid of a square, what I would do, and watch how I do this, is I would just take the square root of the entire right-hand side. I write it right there, right over the right-hand side of the problem. And the rule of solving is I can do whatever I want as long as I do it to both sides. Side. So I'm going to jump across the equal sign, and I will also take the square root of 42. And now my equ equation is still balanced, so I'm safe. Let's see what happens. On the right-hand side, square and square root will cancel so that my S will be alone just like I want it. And on the left-hand side, there's the calculator work to do. And I, this is what, one reason it's very good to have a TI-30XS because square rooting is one of the things students struggle with with this calculator. Uh, and it's because it's hard to type in and because it, depending on what mode the calculator's in, you could get a different answer. So I go to type in square root of 42, and the way I type it in, you're going to notice that the square root button is in green above the x squared button. So if I want to type anything that's green, I have to hit the second, the green second button first. So I type second and then the x squared, and then I type in 42, and sometimes you'll type that in, and you won't get the kind of answer you were expecting. Um, in fact, very commonly, you'll get the same answer. You'll type that in and your calculator will spit out, that is the square root of 42. And you'll be like, not helpful. And if that happens, it me means you're in the wrong mode. So it's super important if you're expecting a decimal answer to put your calculator into classic mode. See why I want you to play with one of these calculators before you take your GED? So mm -hmm. I hit mode, I arrow over classic, and hit enter. And now I can type in the square root of 42, and it gives me a decimal answer. 6.4807, yada, yada, yada. Okay, that is what my calculator says. I'm almost done with this problem, but I do need to f follow the rounding directions. So did you guys happen to notice these rounding directions? Yes, I did. To the nearest tenth. So as we've talked about before, tenth is one decimal place. So I'm going to cut it off right after that decimal place. I'm going to consider the next number, the number I was about to throw away, and ask myself if I'm halfway through my digits yet. 
Am I halfway through my digits? Well, yeah, yeah. I'm five yeah. or higher. And so I'm going to round up this number. So I'm going to call this 6.5 and 6.5 what? Plain old inches because it's a dimension. So can you see how we're bringing together a lot of skills here, a lot of skills. So let's take a look at number four. It says a snack food company has decided to package its new brand of crackers in a box shaped like a rectangular prism. So I find that super important because they just told me the name of the shape. Okay. It's essential to know the name of the shape in order to locate the proper formula. Now they say the box needs to have a volume of 206 and one quarter cubic inches. So they also gave me a volume. Okay. So right there on my GED formula sheet, I have formulas for area perimeter, but I also have formulas for, so I haven't even read anything more. And I know that this relationship of a volume of a rectangular prism is going to come into play, but I do see some more information. I see how big the volume is 206 and one quarter cubic inches. I see the width. If the width of the box is going to be seven and a half inches, and I see the depth, as they call it here, the depth of the box is going to be two and a half inches. And then they ask me a question. They say, what must the height of the box be? So if I was going to solve a problem like this, the first thing I'd want to do is go find the appropriate formula. So I need to know the shape name, and whether I'm looking at volume, area, perimeter, or surface area in order to find the appropriate shape, uh, appropriate formula. Sorry, the volume I... section is part of the third section, and you're going to notice it says surface area and volume. Okay, I have it up. And we want the volume of a rectangular prism. Oh, that's the first option, too. Yes, it is. Rectangles are common, and they happen a lot in life. And luckily, they're also easy to work with. So what does that formula say? It should start with a V because I want the volume one. V equals? Length, width, and height. Exactly. And see how those letters are all shoved together like that? Yeah. They're multiplying. Whether you realize it or not, anytime two things are shoved up together with nothing between them, in algebra class, they're multiplying. So that's length times width times height. Okay. So if you wanted to find the volume of the thing, you would just multiply together the three dimensions. But we don't want to find the volume. We want to use the volume to find a missing dimension. So let's plug in what we know. I could right now write 206 and one quarter. But I have to tell you the truth, Saleya, I am too lazy to do that. Okay. I don't want to mess around in my calculator with fractions. And I happen to know the decimal for one quarter. And you might say to me, Kate, I don't know any decimal versions for fractions, but I say, Saleya, you do, because you've had a quarter in your pocket. One quarter is worth how much? 25. Exactly. And so one quarter is the same as 0.25. Like if you had $206 and one quarter, you would have 206.25. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm going to plug in a decimal purely out of laziness, so I'll have an easier time plugging it into my calculator. And so I plug that in for V. Now the next thing the formula says I need is L. So I'm gonna go looking in my formula for the L. And you're gonna notice something. They give me a width of seven and a half. They tell me I'm finding the height, uh, the H, but they don't give me a length. And it doesn't matter. Sometimes we use words interchangeably. Depth, length, I, I don't care. Same difference, okay? So the three dimensions of a rectangular solid are the three dimensions. So this right here is my length, okay? So it's going to be two and a half inches. And again, I'm too lazy to write uh, two and a half. And so I am going to write the decimal form of two and a half, which would be two point what, Miss Leia? 2.5. Exactly. I also know my width. So my next thing I'm supposed to put into my formula is my W. According to this formula, my width is what? Uh, 7.5. Exactly. And I will plug it in with parentheses. Since those two things were shoved up together there, they are multiplying. And an algebra student uses parentheses to say when two things are multiplying, when two numbers are multiplying. Okay. Now H is my mystery. It's the thing I don't know, so it will remain 
an H. Okay, so we said a good wisdom principle after we're done substituting is to do any simplifying, any forwards math before we start solving, doing the algebra. And I do see some simplifying I can do. Right there, I see two numbers that are shoved together with just parentheses between them. That's multiplication. So I can do that multiplication, why not? And I'm going to go ahead and do that in my calculator because I'm lazy. 2.5 times 7.5 is 18.75. And right underneath, I write 18.75. Make sure you write your simplified things right underneath so that you can see I've just replaced this portion with that number. Everything else I have not touched, so every other part of my formula will drop. Now it is time, because there's no more math, no more simplifying to do, it's time to solve for H to get H alone. And to solve, I always do the opposite of what's happening because I'm trying to get rid of things. And so I'm going to do the opposite of 18.75 times H. I'm going to divide by this number I want to get rid of so that H can be alone. The rule of solving is I can do whatever I want as long as I do it to both sides. So I'm going to jump across my equal sign, jump across my equal sign, and divide by the exact same number. Let's see what happens. Well, on the right-hand side, multiplying by 18.75 and dividing by 18.75 are opposites. So they would cancel, and I'd be left with just what? What do you see on that right-hand side? The H. Exactly. The H would be still there. And now on this left-hand side, you can see that's the math to type into your calculator. Remember, a fraction bar means the same as divide. So I am going to do 206. 0.25 divided by 18.75 and I get nice and easy 11. Now when we get here we have to ask ourselves 11 what? My final solution should have a unit. Make sure your final solution has a unit. Would it be the inches? Exactly. If the length and the width were measured in inches the height is measured in inches. We just have inches all around. Okay. Okay. Very nice. Plain old linear inches. Okay. We are looking at number five now. Okay. So similar wording here, but I've changed something and it's going to make things a little trickier. A snack food company has decided to package its new brand of cheese puffs in a cylindrical package. So we've heard some shape information again, but this time I've got a different shape. I've got a cylinder. If the total volume of the package needs to be uh, 1,730 cubic centimeters and the height of the cylinder is 22 centimeters, what must the radius of the cylinder be to the nearest centimeter? So I know it's a cylinder and I have a known volume. I'm gonna need to start with the volume of the cylinder formula. Take a look at your formula sheet. Do you see that, Saleya? And make sure you give me the volume formula. Some people try to give me the SA one. That's surface area. Volume would start with V. I can't tell if that's an R though. It says V equals, looks like pi squared and then H. Hmm, it's pi R squared H. I couldn't tell if that was an R or not. Yeah, hard because you're on a little bitty screen, huh? Yeah, okay, that is an R. I just wasn't sure. Mm-hmm. So pi r squared h, um, and we are going to plug into this sucker everything that we know. Every known value is going to get substituted in now for our next step. Um, I know the volume. The volume is known, isn't it? The volume yeah. is 1730. Exactly, and so under v, I will trade that out for a 1730. Now I'll keep my equal signs, but there's always um, a choice when we see pi. When we're substituting, we have a choice. We could leave pi pi. That means just leave that pi symbol in the problem. And that is a legit exact answer. Math, math teachers have no problem leaving pi around. Or we can use an approximation of pi. And the most common approximation of pi that people use is the decimal approximation, 3.14. But it's certainly not the only one. I've seen students who just use three. I've seen students who use a fraction approximation. But it's just, you know, close enough. <laughs> 
the GED formula sheet does tell us that when we're approximating to use 3.14 for pi. So that is what I will choose when I choose to approximate. And there's some language in this problem that tells me to approximate. Do you see this language here that says to the nearest centimeter? Yeah. Whenever you have rounding language that talks about rounding, that's a clue that you're not going to have an exact answer anyway. So who cares if you use an approximation? So because of that rounding language, I'm going to write 3.14 instead of writing pi. Um, do I know my radius? No. No, it's unknown. So unknown things remain letters. So my radius squared will stay right there. Do I know my height? 22 centimeters. Exactly. So underneath H, I will write 22, and those things are shoved together, so they're multiplying. So I'll put my 22 in those time, that multiplication uh, parentheses. So a lot of students tell me there's no simplifying I can do. Right-hand side looks impossible to them, but I actually do see something I can do. See how these three things, R squared, 3.14, and 22, are all shoved together like that? Yeah. That means they're all three multiplying. And as it turns out, it doesn't matter what order you multiply in. It doesn't matter at all. That's a super important math principle name is known as the associative principle. I can group and multiply in any order I want. So what I'm going to do is use that power to multiply together the two numbers. I am going to multiply together 3.14 and 22. And I get 69.08. Okay, so when I did that, I used up this number and I used up this number. But there's something I haven't touched yet. I haven't touched the R squared, so it needs to still be here. I'm going to drop it down. And now on the other side, there's no work to do. There's only one number over there, so I'll just leave him be. And so I've done my simplifying. Now it's time to start solving. It's time to start getting R alone. And you can see this time, and this is the first time we've had this experience, there's actually two numbers to get rid of. There's that 69.08, but there's also that square, that little floating two that we need to get rid of, okay? And so we were, are going to move the multiplier first. Now, the rule is to move something, we do the opposite. So I divided by 69.08 on both sides of my equation. So on the right-hand side, let's see what happens. 69.08 and 69.08 multiplying and dividing would cancel, leaving me like I wanted with just R squared. And I kind of ran out of room, so I'm coming to the right here. And on the left-hand side, there's the math to do. And that is so gross, I'm totally doing that in a calculator. And I'm going to get a gross answer, and that's okay. It happens all the time on these problems. Even if you don't write down the whole thing, keep the whole number in your calculator. So I do that and I get like 25 point yada, 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 and it goes on for a while. And I'm just gonna keep the whole number in my calculator even though I write down only a little bit of it. Now I'm almost done. R is almost alone, but not quite. I have to get rid of a square. Did you catch earlier what we said the opposite of squaring was? Square root? Exactly. And so I'll take the square root. In order to get rid of the square, I'll do the opposite, the square root. And that rule of solving is I can do whatever I want as long as I do it to both sides. So I'm going to jump my equal sign and I'm going to put the square root on the left-hand side as well. Let's see what happens. On the right-hand side, I'm looking at my equation. My square and my square root cancel, so just like I wanted, R is alone. And then on the left-hand side, there's the math to do. And our TI is really good about taking, picking up long, ugly numbers. Okay, the way I'm going to do that, and this is mostly for the crowd since I recognize you don't have this calculator yet, but people do watch the videos. Again, I'm going to press second and the square root button so I can get the square root. But then I want the answer. Notice ANS printed above the little minus sign at the bottom. So it's in green, so I'm going to have to press second again, and I press that minus button that has ANS answer over it. So second square root of the second answer, and it tells me that it is 5.004, yada, yada, yada. Now, at the end, I need to follow rounding directions. So according to my rounding directions, it says to go to the nearest centimeter. And we said if they just have a nearest unit, that means cut it at the decimal place. So that is what I will do. I will cut my number at the decimal place. I will consider the number I'm about to throw away. It's definitely not big enough to matter. So that radius is about five centimeters. So a candy company has decided to package its new brand of breath mints in a cylindrical package. So again, I see a cylinder. If the volume of the package 
must be 35 cubic centimeters and the radius of the package is one and a half centimeters, what should the height of the packaging be to the nearest centimeter? So once again, I see the relationship between volume of a cylinder and its dimensions. And so I should bust out the volume of a cylinder formula. So humor me one more time, go looking for that cylinder, volume of a cylinder formula for me, Saleya. Is V equals pi R squared H. Good. Now let's plug in what we know. So we always write the formula down, then we do the substitution. So what do we know? Um, we know that the volume has to be 35 centimeters. Good, so I'll plug in 35 under the V, and I don't usually bother to write centimeters right now, not until the end. Okay, and now we know a decimal approximation for pi as well, and I think we'll use it because I see some rounding language in my problem. See that rounding language? Yeah. To the nearest centimeter. Big clue to use 3.14. Right. What else do I know? Uh, the radius of the package is one and a half centimeters. So right under R, I'll write 1.5. Notice that I use parentheses before I write my exponent. It's super important when you're plugging in to exponential expressions. So anything with an exponent on it uh, that you use parentheses. Um, and it's going to make a difference on some problems, not this particular problem, but on many it would. So I have the 1.5 in parentheses and I square it. And then do I know my height? No, we do not. No, that's the mystery. So mysteries are letters. That's all a letter is, a mystery number that we haven't yet found. Okay. Now we said a really smart, wise thing to do is simplify before you solve. Do you see any forward simplifying math to do? So numbers on the same side of the equation. Take a look right here. This is what I'm talking about. See how those oh. numbers are all jammed up against each other there? Yeah. The 3.14 times 1.5 squared. Those are all numbers. There's no letters right there at that little chunk. I could do that math and do that simplifying. Even though I can't mess with the H, I could do all those numbers. And so I'm going to do that in my calculator. I'm going to type 3.14. I'm going to open up a parentheses, type 1.5, close it. And then I'm going to type the X squared button. So this is what I typed, 3.14, open 1.5. And then I type the X squared button to get a square out. So x squared button, and I got this whole expression here, this whole area chunk turned into 7.065. So I replaced that part of the equation with that, but I don't replace my h because I haven't dealt with it yet. I don't replace my equals because your relationship has to stay the same, and there's my left-hand side. So that's what I meant by simplifying, just obeying the signs. Those signs say multiply and square. So now though, now is the time, there's no more simplifying to do, now is the time to start solving. Do you see that seven all shoved up against that H? Yeah. In order for H to be alone, I need to move that number. You can only move things by doing the opposite. So the opposite of multiplying is dividing. I'm going to divide by 6.0 or 7.065. Now the rule of solving literally is you can do whatever you want. You can do anything you want as long as you do it to both sides to keep your balance. So I'm gonna come over here to this side of the equal sign, I'll do the exact same thing. Let's see what happens when we make that change to our equation. So 7.065 multiplying and 7.065 dividing cancel so that my H is alone just like I wanted. And on this side, there's the work to type into your calculator. We're gonna do 35 divided by 7.065. And I get something long and nasty, 4.953, yada, 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 out of my calculator. And so for my final act, I will round and put on a unit. So let's round this sucker. We were supposed to round to the nearest centimeter. So again, that's a unit. Centimeter, inch, yard, meter, foot, dollar. It's a unit. And so I'm going to round to at the decimal place. Consider the number about to to be thrown out, and is it big enough to matter? It sure is, and so I'm gonna call that five. Five centimeters is the height. Um, yeah, the area of a circle is 40 square centimeters. What is the radius of the circle rounded to the nearest tenth of a centimeter? So I can see that I've been given my area, and I know that I have a circle. And so what formula should I start with? Well, the area of the circle formula. Okay, so uh, when you're ready, take a look at your formula sheet and tell me the area of a circle, A equals what? 
would be A equals pi R squared. Brilliant. And now we'll plug in what we know. So you help me substitute into this formula. What do I know? Uh, you know the area is 40 square centimeters. Cool. And you need, oh, you need to find the radius of the circle. Mm-hmm. So how about pi? Because the next thing in my formula is pi. I'm looking right at pi right now. So what should I do with pi? Should I use a decimal approximation? Well, as usual, look at what I see. Rounded to the nearest tenth of a Rounding center. Rounding so, yeah. my Permission to approximate, approximate gra granted. Okay, I just got permission to approximate. Okay, so I'll call pi 3.14, and then you're right. I'm looking for r. r is a mystery, so it'll remain r. And I never, ever change operations, so I'll keep that little square. Okay. Okay. Um, how's that look? Yeah, it looks fine. Maybe I should have put these first, because this one's easier to solve than the last one. But it's really similar. There's a couple of things that I have to get rid of. Now, you might be asking, well, can't I just square the number I did that earlier, but I did that earlier, not squaring. I did that earlier multiplying, like I multiplied two numbers that were on either side of the variable. So order doesn't matter when you're multiplying, but it's not the same when it's different operations. So one of these is multiplying, this is multiplying, and one of these is squaring, that's a different operation. And so I'm not going to take that square from the R and drop it on over to the number. That is not legal. Okay, so there is no simplifying to do here. I am merely going to solve this problem. I'm going to get rid of these two operations. I'm going to get rid of the multiplier, and I'm going to get rid of the square. And once again, we get rid of the multiplier first. And so I am going to get rid of a multiplier by dividing. I'm going to divide by that number I want to get rid of. Are you cool with that? Uh-huh. Now the rule of solving is I can do whatever I want, literally, as long as I do it to both sides. Yes, yeah, um, you're going to hear my voice in your head when you go to take your test, I hope, Celia. <laughs> okay, so on the right-hand side, multiplying by 3.14 and dividing by 3.14 cancel, leaving me with just? R squared. Exactly. And on the left-hand side, there's the calculator work you promised to do. Just go ahead and do it. So I will do it as well. 40 divided by 3.14 gives me something gross. I'll just write down a few digits because I'm too lazy. 12.73, yada, 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 yada. But I'll keep the number in my calculator, okay? I won't round till the end in my calculator. Okay, I'm almost done. R is almost alone, but I have got to get rid of that square. Do you remember what the opposite of square was? Square root. Exactly. I'll take the square root of both sides because it's a change I'm choosing to make. So square and square root cancel, leaving R alone just like I wanted. And on this side, there's the math to do. And I'll remind you in your TI, you press the second button to get to that square root. And then you press the second to pick up an old answer uh, because the answer thing is above the minus. So second square root, second answer. And I get that it's about 3.569, yada, yada, yada. Only thing to do is round this sucker and give it a unit. What do my rounding directions say? Round to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. Nearest tenth. Tenth is one decimal place. So after the decimal place, I'll cut it off. I'll consider the number about to die. Is it big enough to matter? Yes, it's more than halfway through my digits. And so I will call that 3.6. 3.6 centimeters. Plain old linear units for a dimension. Okay, the circumference of a circle is eight yards. What is the diameter of the circle rounded to the nearest hundredth of a yard? Now, I wanted to do this one because you actually have choice when you look at circumference of a circle on the GED formula sheet. They have more than one formula. And students freak out like, which one do I use? Okay, so first of all, to locate circumference. Circumference is the outside of a circle, and so because it's the outside line, it's going to be, and I shouldn't even use the word outside, but it's that line around a circle. Um, because it's that line around a circle, it's going to be in the perimeter section. So do you see it under perimeter? Do you see circumference of a circle? Yeah. And notice that there's two options. Perimeter of a circumference of a circle. Oh, boy. 
is t equals two pi r or c equals pi d exactly and stop reading right there okay. i know they give you more information on that line but the more information they give you is just the decimal approximation of pi they then say and pi is about 3.14 that's all they're saying there okay okay so those are your two formula choices okay and so students freak out which one should i use and i say you should use whichever one makes your life easier so notice what i'm trying to find in this formula they're asking me what is the diameter diameter and notice only one of these formulas has a diameter, a D in it. It's this one here that has the D in it. Do you see? Yeah. And so that's the one I'll use. I'll use the one that makes my life easier. Okay. Um, could I use the other one too? Yeah, but I'd have more work to do. Okay. So here I have C equals pi D. And I'm going to plug in what I know. What do I know? You know that the circumference is eight yards. And I also know that I can go ahead and approximate pi because I have this rounding language anyway. So I'll use that known value of pi that the formula sheet told me about, 3.14. Okay. And again, it's an approximation for pi, but it's good enough if we're going to round anyway. Yeah. And now my diameter is my mystery. And so it will remain a letter. And maybe we should have started with this problem because this is so easy to solve. Can you see how I could get D alone right here? Yeah, you would just uh, divide those two, which is exactly the same, so they'd cancel out. Exactly. And the rule of solving is I can do whatever I want as long as I do both sides. So I'll jump over the other side of the equal sign and write the exact same thing over there. On the right-hand side, multiplying by 3.14 and dividing by 3.14 cancel, leaving me with just D. And on the left-hand side, there's the calculator work to do. 8 divided by 3.14. That's all algebra is, the ability to move backwards. So we can do things, but we can also undo them once we get to equations. 2.547, yada, 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 yada. Okay? Mm -hmm. And now let's follow our rounding directions. What place do they ask me to round to? A hundredth of a yard. Good. Do you know um, how many decimal places, a hundredths places? Wouldn't it be the third one? That's what we think because it feels like it because 100 has two, you know, three numbers in it. But yeah. careful, there's no ones place in decimal world. So the first one's tenths and the second one's hundredths. So the mirror of reflection wow. is actually on the ones place. And then, and then it starts mirroring. There's no, there's no ones. It doesn't make sense to take one thing and break it into one place. So no. You start at tenths and then you go into hundredths. And then everything else after that is a perfect mirror. Okie dokie. So I'm going to round to two decimal places, the hundredths place. So I'll cut it right after the second decimal place. I'll consider the number I'm about to throw away. And maybe that's what you meant by three decimal places. Look at that one. But when I look at that one, I see it's big enough to matter. It's more than halfway through our digit system. And so I will bump this up to five. So I'll get 2.55 uh, yards. Okay, let's try number 10. The circumference of a circle is 15 meters. What is the radius of the circle rounded to the nearest tenth of a meter? So let's think what formula shall we use now? So we have the circumference of the circle and we're looking for the radius. So that would be the C equals two pi R, wouldn't it? Yes, you're thinking just like a mathematician. You're going, how could I be as lazy as possible? I'll use the formula that has everything I need. Okay. <laughs> Okay, beautiful. Now let's substitute in what we know. Will you help me substitute? Yeah, the circumference. Oh, well, I'm reading the wrong one. Sorry. But yeah, the circumference of a circle of this circle is 15 meters. Mm -hmm. How about pi? I'm going to call pi. It's kind of unfair because in this entire exercise, we've always called pi pi, but we do have other problems we've seen in other videos where pi was not 3.14. It was we use the letter, we just use the symbol pi. But um, yeah, I have rounding language, so I'll call pi 3.14. And then we need to find the radius of the circle rounded to the nearest tenth of a meter. Exactly, so we'll keep our r there. Okay, now I see some simplifying I can do. I see some math I know how to do forwards, and I can just go ahead and do it. Do you see that, Saleya? The two and the multiplied by the uh, pi? Exactly. I can do okay. 2 times 3.14. There's no reason not to. So I'll do that, making my problem simpler. I'm simplifying. So I get 6.28 there. Now I haven't touched the R, the equals, or the 15. 
And now this is an easy one to solve. Can you see how to solve this? Whenever you're not sure what to do to solve, ask yourself what's happening here. What are R and this number doing if they're all shoved together like this? Oh, you multiply. They are multiplying, but I can't do this multiplication. I can't do it. I couldn't obey even if I wanted to because I don't know what the heck R is. So in a million years, I could never multiply 6.28 in R. I'd never be able to make that any simpler. So instead of doing the math that they told me, I'm going to be disobedient. I'm going to do the opposite in order to get R alone. What's the opposite of multiplying? Divide. Divide. That is why I choose to divide, to get rid of that multiplication I can't do. So I'll divide by 6.28. Now the rule of solving is you can do whatever you want. You could be disobedient, but you have to do it to both sides. So you better pop across here and divide by 6.28 over there as well. Okay. On the right hand side, multiplying by 6.28 and dividing by 6.28 cancels so that my R is alone like I wanted. And on the left hand side, there's the math to do 15 divided by 6.28 is some gross ugly 2.3 yuck, 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 yuck. I sound like one of the three stooges. Yuck, yuck, yuck. So I forgot, is 10th the number right after the decimal exactly. or the second number after? Okay. Exactly. So this is the place where I want my number to stop. It's at the 10th place. But it's okay. kind of weird because even when you round to the 10th place, you have to consider the next number. So that's why some students sometimes mix up which place I'm looking at. So I'm mm -hmm. stopping my number after the 10th place, but I'm still about going to consider the number I'm about to throw away to ask myself if I was more than halfway there yet. So was I more than halfway there? Of course I was. I'm halfway through, more than halfway through my digit system. And so that's going to go up to 2.4. And so I have a final answer of 2.4 meters. And that's tricky. That's tricky. That's why rounding confuses some students. So now this is as tricky as these problems get, but I think we're going to be okay. okay. Uh, because you've built up a lot of good skills now. I'm impressed by how quickly you just caught on. You're kind of a math natural, my dear. Thank you. That's one I've never heard before. <laughs> but seriously, I just no, no. There is nothing in math that's ha too hard. There's just a lot in math that if we teach too fast, um, it gets confusing. It gets confusing. Exactly. Too many skills at once. That's it. Mm -hmm. And I just threw you. Seriously, this is deep end stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So number 12 says the area of a circle is 75 square inches. What is the diameter of the circle rounded to the nearest inch? So what I want you to notice when you look at this formula is you don't have any options. Okay. There's only one area of a circle formula. Do you see that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to use it whether I like it or not. Um, and it, it won't give me exactly what I need. But the GED doesn't promise to give you exactly what you need. Sometimes you have to use some math reasoning to figure out what you need. So we're going to use the formula to figure out what it will tell us, and then we'll use that answer to get to where we need. So, and why do I say that? Why am I having this whole long speech? Because the area of a circle formula says A equals pi R squared. There's no diameter in it. And I don't have an option for another formula. This is my only choice for area. And so this is the one I'm going to use. Okay. We will substitute into it. A is 75 for my area. I have rounding language, so I will use 3.14 for pi. And I don't know my radius. And maybe you think I don't really want to know my radius, but I promise you radius will help us get to diameter. Now I can see here that this is a two-step equation to solve. R is not alone because two things are happening to R. R is right now being multiplied and R is being squared. Do you remember which one I said we'd get rid of first when we had both those things going on? It is the multiplier. Okay, that's what I With thought. For a real live sure. reason, it's because have you ever heard of the order of operations, my dear? I've heard of it. Yeah, so that'll be an important skill for you. I do have a video on that. You can check it out. Okay. But when you're simplifying, when you're putting numbers together, you work the order of operations uh, in the usual order. Groupings, exponents, multiplication in its inverse, addition in its inverse. This is when you're simplifying. But when you're solving, you actually work it backwards. You are going to, when you're doing the opposite, when you're undoing stuff, you're going to do it in the opposite order. And so um, I have to move any multipliers before I move any exponents. And that's why. There's a real reason. It's not just because Kate said so. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to divide by 3.14 on both sides because I always try to keep my equations balanced. So if I make a change, I do it to both sides. So let's see what happens here. On the right-hand side, multiplying by 3.14 and dividing by 3.14 would cancel, leaving me with just... R squared. 
Beautiful. And on the left-hand side, there's the gross work to do. So 75 divided by 3.14, my calculator will do the gross for me. I'll keep all those ugly digits in my calculator, even though I'm too lazy to write them all down. And I'm almost done. I'm almost done because R is almost alone, but R is not quite alone. What can I do to get R alone? Oh, is it the square root? It sure is. Opposite okay. of square is square root. So I'll take the square root. Again, I am being disobedient here. I'm doing the opposite of what I've been told. So I do it to both sides to keep my balance. Squaring and square root cancel because they're opposites and R is alone. And there's the math to do. And again, to type this into your calculator, you press second square root, second answer, be super lazy like I am. And you get four point gross, 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 gross. Yeah, careful. You don't want to round till you're at the very end. And this is the trick of this problem. Okay. R, the letter R stands for radius. Radius. This is a radius, but they didn't ask me for radius, did they? They said, what is the... Diameter. Diameter. This is one of the few skills that's not on the formula sheet that you actually just have to know. You don't have another option. You have to know the relationship between radius and diameter. So we learned this in our circle class. So if anybody needs a longer explanation, go back and look at the circle class. But I will remind you guys that a radius goes from the center of a circle out uh, to the edge. But a diameter, let's get a different color, goes all the way from edge to edge through the center. And so when you look at it in this picture, it's easy to see that one diameter is the same as two radii. I think that's the plural of radius. If it's not, I'm sure the internet will connect, correct me. But can you see that from here to here is one radius? Here to here would be another radius. And so there's two radiuses in the diameter. Does that make sense? Yeah. This you have to know. The formula sheet doesn't tell it to you. You have to just know this relationship. So you have to know how to get from radius to diameter, diameter to radius, back and forth. So it's, there are two radiuses that make up a diameter. So if I want to turn this number into a diameter, I would need to multiply by two. So that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply my radius by two. And people are like, is that okay? Can you just do whatever you want with an answer? Yeah, uh-huh, you can. <laughs> So I, then I get this long, ugly number. And now, now that I have the thing I was looking for, the diameter, now I'll round. This one says rounded to the nearest inch. inch. So again, it's a unit, so I'll go right at the decimal place. Consider the number I'm about to throw away. It is big enough to matter, and so I'll say that's about 10 inches. Hello, deep waters. <laughs> Are you okay, Saleya? Yeah. Good. If I have a little prescription for you, and actually, I'll just say this to the entire internet, because I have students who watch videos out of sequence all the time. If you found that this was challenging for you, there's a few skills that went into this, okay? So, um, here's the first one. Just the opposites, when we were talking about those inverses and opposites, I have a solving, oh, actually, I didn't call it that. I called it an intro to algebra lesson. You want me to look that video up? You might want to watch that. That's that principle of inverses, that we can do whatever we want as long as we do it to both sides in order to isolate variables. Spend a full hour just practicing that one skill. The other one you might want to look at is the order of operations. But we definitely referred to the order of operations when I was explaining why we did what in what order. So that's a useful base skill to know. And then the other one is the utilizing the formula sheet. So most of my students got to practice the formula sheet forward before they jumped into the deep waters of algebra. And I think I called that A and P with the formula sheet. And that's part of our current lesson. It's one of the first videos I did. It's part okay. of our current unit, I mean. Um, uh, it's nice to just play with these formulas a little bit before you have to do any algebra with them. So I have okay. those three videos. I think that if you found any of this overwhelming, those will fill in the gaps of your knowledge. So even if you watch those three and then re-watch this one, you might go, oh, this is way easier than I thought it was. Great having you in class today. As I always say, I love, love, love not having to talk to myself. And uh, hopefully I'll see you next week.